Well, good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing? Hey, I wonder, can I just ask you just to stand for a moment? And uh, I know Pastor Monica's already prayed, but I'd just love to pray again as we go into this part of the service where we're kind of just getting into his word. Who's ready for the word this morning? Good. Well, Father, we welcome your presence again in this place today. As Monica said, it's from glory to glory. And we pray that, that even that glory to glory thing will kind of grow even in this service. That from the worship to the message and back into a song and just, just releasing something of our praise to you this morning, God, that you would release your glory in this place. There will be a manifestation of your presence and your power and your goodness and your love. Father, I pray that it will be felt and known and experienced in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said together, amen, amen. You're welcome to take your, your seats. Well, as Monica said, I've got the amazing privilege this morning of carrying on with our uh, series that we're doing at the moment called Glory. And uh, actually, for me, preaching on God's glory is, is pretty cool because maybe I'm a bit biased when I say this, but I reckon the word glory sounds great in a Welsh accent. It's glory. It's the glory. And it, it makes me think of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He used to talk about the rule and the reign and the realm of God. Man, it just, it just sounds anointed when you say it, doesn't it? It's like, <laughs> so I've got the privilege of preaching on the glory this morning. And I pray actually that we'll experience the rule and the reign and the realm of God in this place this morning. Good. So um, I just want to recap a little bit on what Mark was talking about last week. By the way, Pastor Mark preached an awesome message last week on God's glory. I want to encourage you. Uh, to go and listen to it on our podcast. Maybe if you w were here last week and you want to listen to it again, I would really encourage you to do that. As Monica said, you never really get all this stuff in one go. It's kind of like, you know, it's like the book of Isaiah says, God says, here a little, there a little, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. It's kind of a, a revelation that develops a bit at a time. So I just want to encourage us to keep sticking with this idea and maybe even go back and listen to that message that Mark preached on last week. And just again, a little bit of a recap, really. If you, just, if you remember, if you were here, Mark talked about things like, well, he focused on God's glory being God's presence, uh, his power, and his goodness, which I think is a really good summary, actually, of, of the glory of God. Mark talked about how it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's like the sum of the whole person of God. So when you encounter God's glory, you are encountering like the whole person um, of, of God himself. It's like you start to experience him as a whole person in terms of who he is, what he does, what he, what he has in, his, in terms of power, and how he gives that to us. So I thought that was really, really cool. And then, and then Mark uh, briefly touched on this idea. He talked about three stages that you sometimes see in ministry or in kind of, you know, our experience with God or God's ministry. And he kind of talked first about, about faith. You know, that's one level where we start to interact with, with God's presence and is like we're putting our trust in God. Uh, and I kind of love actually the, uh, the Amplified, amplified uh, version of the Bible's definition of faith where it says to, to lean into God with your whole personality, leaning into his power, his goodness, and his wisdom. So I kind of love that. So like, here's the thing. God is fully in. You know, he's all in. And then God wants us to be all in. And I reckon just at that point, you could just go off on a tangent and preach a great message on, like, they are the ingredients for revival. Like, when God, we know God is all in. And when we are all in, especially when you've got a whole group of people together that are all in, man, I tell you, that's a real powerful thing. It once, once again, in fact, quoting Martin Lloyd-Jones, Martin Lloyd-Jones said that revival is basically a whole group of people getting baptized with the Holy Spirit at the same time. Man, doesn't that give you goosebumps just thinking about that? Like, can you imagine not just like a personal experience, but all of us together just experiencing together a fresh baptism of the Spirit, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, be careful, watch out, that's a revival. So man, you, something's going to kick off from, from that moment. So Mark talked a little bit about faith, and then he went on to talk about, about anointing, where, 
where kind of God uses us, right? So God flows through us. Maybe we lay hands on people. They get healed. They get delivered. Something's imparted to their life. And that's a really cool thing that we get used in those ways, right? But then the third stage is that, and I was actually talking to Mark about this yesterday, and it was, really, it was a good, good conversation. He's kind of unpacking that a little bit more. And he said, yeah, it's, it's kind of a little bit like this, that when you, when you kind of like, you, you come to the climax of anointing, and you think, man, it's got to be more, like, but it's like, how do we get more of this? And then it's like, wow, then you start tapping into God's glory. And God's glory really is like God just doing it without really, you know, any human agent, ne- you know, being necessary for the, for the encounter. So let me give an example. One day, actually it was Nicola that told me this story, that there was a girl that visited here one, one morning some months ago, a young adult. It was her first time in church, and she was kind of sitting uh, just around about there, or standing, I can't remember if it was in the message or in the worship time, and somebody said from the front, being filled with the Spirit. And they just kind of verbalized that from the front, being filled with the Spirit. Well, when that statement was given, she got filled with the Spirit. And like she'd never been to church before, she didn't know anything about church or God, and she just got filled with the Holy Spirit, standing right there. Isn't that cool? Come on, that's really cool stuff. Now, I would say that that's the glory of God. See, like no one laid hands on her. It was just God was in the room doing something and God just filled her. Now, actually, Nicola did say to me, that girl hasn't come back since. Now, I don't know whether she was just visiting. Maybe she was like a uni student that's gone back home or something. Some people think she's been raptured. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but like it, it doesn't really matter, does it, like if she hasn't come back. I suppose it is a bit of a problem if she's been raptured, because that means we are left behind, right? So I hope she hasn't been raptured. But the point is, is that that girl that morning experienced, I believe, the glory of God. And I pray that we will experience the glory of God. That God would just be moving all around the place as things are said from the front, as we worship, uh, basically that God is just, wow, man, people in the corner getting filled with the Spirit, healing's breaking out, deliverance is happening because of the atmosphere of God's glory. Man, isn't that cool? Man, I'm really longing for that. So what I want to do, just taking this a bit further this morning, I want to start talking about, uh, just briefly, the difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. So the omnipresence of God is kind of God being everywhere at the same time. Man, isn't, try to get your head around that. It's like, wow. It's like, so God can be with you on a Monday morning where you are, and he can also be with me where I am. Like God is everywhere at the same time. So David says in Psalm 139, where, where can I flee from your presence? You know, where, where can I go? I don't think he was saying it because he wanted to run away from his presence. I think he was just making the point, man, if I wanted to, which I don't, but if I wanted to, everywhere I go, you're there. That's a really cool thought, just to think about it. If you, like if you were able to transport yourself to the moon right now, bang, and just go, get on, go on to the moon and on the surface of the moon, God is there. God, you could experience God there. In fact, I remember one, uh, one preacher saying this. I thought it was such a great statement. He said, the environment of the fish is the sea. The environment of the bird is the air. And the environment of the universe is God. And by the way, I said that the right way around. I didn't say the environments, the environment of God is the universe. The environment of the universe is in God. <laughs> Could just get your head on that for a moment. It's like Isaiah talks about God holding just the earth in his hand, like it's like the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Man, that's awesome. That powerful God is everywhere at the same time. But yet, God also manifests his presence in certain places at certain times. And you hear stories of this actually about revival. Um, in fact, Bill Johnson says that sometimes God's presence is geographical. I was actually reading a book 
yesterday by a guy called Dr. Michael Brown, and he was actually having to, ha, he was referring to the Welsh revival. And people were driving to Wales to, to get an encounter with God, and basically what would happen is that they would turn up like to certain places, and, and they would say, people would ask the question, how will I know that I've like come to the right place? And do you know what the response was? You'll feel it. You'll feel it. How do I know I'm going to the right place? You'll feel it. How do, you, how do I know that I'm going to drive to the right place? God will lead you. You'll feel it. They reckon you could cross the border, and as you cross the border, you felt the presence of God. George Whitfield, an old revivalist, used to preach this. I want to preach a felt Christ. A felt Christ. Man, isn't that awesome? Like, who believes that we can experience God? And I love that. I want to preach a felt Christ, that me and you experience his goodness. So even this idea, you think of, of God creating, creating the universe, creating the world. Um, I really believe that we were actually made for the glory of God. We were made for God's presence. If you look, actually read, read through Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, thinking about this idea, you know, that the, the environment of the the fish is the this, is this sea, and the environment of the bird is the air. You kind of read about that in Genesis chapter 1, don't you? Actually, what happens in Genesis chapter 1 is that God creates everything first in the first three days, and then, the ne- and then in f- day 4, 5, and 6, he fills it. He fills, he f- you know, he, he adds all the life parts into what he's already formed. Now, it's interesting that when you read kind of just ge- in Genesis chapter 2, God puts man in a garden. And, and, and the idea of him putting, you know, putting God in the garden, uh, putting man in the garden is once again to paint the same picture. That man can't really function well without the glory and the presence of God. We need that kind of Eden experience. I believe actually that since we were kind of like, that since that broken relationship and, that, and we were removed from that garden, Every single one of us have been looking to get back there ever since. Every single person is looking to go back to Eden. You know, that kind of like, that place where we experience the love and the rest and the peace and the wholeness that only God can give us. So in a sense, in the garden, and I want to kind of land here for a moment in terms of God's manifest presence, that really... The first time we read about God's manifest presence in the Bible is in the Garden of Eden. And it must have been an amazing experience for Adam and Eve to dwell in the presence and the glory of God like they did. You know, you just, I mean, try to paint a picture. It's not easy to do, but try to paint a picture of what it must have been like being in that place where there's no suffering, no, um, no sorrow, no, no, no tears, no, no sickness. No torment, no demonic torment, no, no anxiety, no depression. But it was a place of God's glory, a place of God's presence, a place of bliss and beauty, a place of completeness, a place of absolute rest, a place where, you know, you could just experience the bliss and the, 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 just the restfulness of being in God's presence. Man, who, who wouldn't want to be in that place. That is such a great place to be. And then what's awesome about it is that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image. So basically, Adam and Eve were kind of like what we could call image bearers. They reflected the goodness and the power and the presence of God. That's what part of their job was, was not only to experience God, but also to reflect him. And this really lands me on the title of my message this morning, which is how to become glory carriers. And in a moment, I want to give us three points on how I think we can become glory carriers. Because what's really interesting about this is that although creation was completed, right, we know that because God rested on the seventh day, Eden wasn't. So creation was complete, but Eden was in a part of the world. And God wanted Adam and Eve to spread the Eden experience right across the globe. 
They were told to be uh, fruitful, to multiply, and to basically fill up the earth. And what is going on now is that though, is Adam and Eve were involved in spreading the Eden-type experience right across the world. And what God was looking for was that his glory and his power and his presence would be spread across the world, and Adam and Eve would multiply. And so what you'd actually have is that you'd have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little image bearers. Isn't that cool? Now, I want to tell you, right, I've, re I've read loads of books on church planting and kind of that, that kind of stuff. For me, this is the best strategy. Just spread the glory. Just get the presence out. Just look to recreate the image of God in people. And you are, in that moment, being an apostolic church. Man, I, I believe it's what Jesus was after. It's what Paul when Paul planted churches, I believe what he was looking for was communities of people that were image bearers. They reflected Jesus, and they, they were filled with the power and the presence of God. And from that place, they became like hubs all over the world to reach and touch the community around them. And now, who wouldn't want to experience the goodness of God? Who wouldn't want to experience the power of God? And so what a, what a great strategy for church planting. Man, let's just spread the glory. Let's uh, get the presence out there into the world. I think that's awesome. Now, what's interesting actually is like the Bible does have quite a bit to say about the glory of God. In Numbers 14, 21, Moses says this, Nevertheless, as surely as I live, um, the, the, as, and as the glory of the Lord will fill the whole earth. I think I said that correct there. Have you got it up on the screen? Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Now, who believes that God, that God lives? Just as true as it is that God lives, God's glory is going to extend right across the world. And he's going ahead of us and making this thing happen. Now, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, Isaiah says it like this. The earth, uh, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now Habakkuk, actually, a later prophet, put these two, puts these two ideas together in Habakkuk 2.14 and says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now I want to ask you like just a bit of a trick question. Don't feel like you have to answer in case you get it wrong. But... But, I mean, how, how much do the waters cover the sea? Some people would say, oh, two-thirds, because they're thinking that two-thirds of the earth is filled with sea. But that's not what God is saying. God is saying that, the, you know, as the waters cover the sea, that's 100%. That's 100%. And what God is saying is that I'm going to cover the whole earth with my glory and the knowledge of my glory. Now, another interesting question is to ask this, is like, is the earth filled with God's glory now? Don't feel like you have to answer because it's a bit of a trick question sometimes. The answer really in many ways is yes. Isaiah chapter 6, the seraphim cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So in one sense, the glory of God, because of his, his presence, is in the earth. However, it needs to be revealed. Because not everybody has the knowledge of it. Not everybody knows it. And that's once again, like just like Adam and Eve, that's where we play our part and we extend and establish the glory and the presence of God by some things I think this morning I'm going to share, the, share with us that's going to help us to be able to manifest the glory of God and be a, a glory carrier. Is that cool? All right, so the first, way, the first way I think in terms of how we become a glory carrier is through worship. How many of us are grateful for this, this morning for our amazing worship team? Man, aren't they incredible? <laughs> by, the, by the way, I'm also super grateful for all the guys that rock up here on a Friday afternoon to set this thing up. 
and on a Sunday morning, they pack down late at night. Just want to say, if you got time on a Friday afternoon or on a Sunday morning, I'm sure these guys would appreciate your help and your support. But <laughs> we're going to speak to John afterwards. But, but, you know, I'm super grateful for the worship that happens in this place. And I've heard a number of people saying, man, Equippers has a great worship. And I want to say amen to that because it is awesome here. And we should not take it for granted because it is incredible and we should keep praying for these guys. But I, I love our moments of worship in this place. And, and just thinking about how it connects with the glory of God. If you read in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says this, And we all who with unveiled, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but basically what Paul is talking about is that as you, in one translation, it says, as you behold, as you behold the glory. That's a bit of an old word now, isn't it? We don't kind of use that word much now, like behold. I don't know how many of us came around the corner, you know, driving around the corner after the fast, and we said, behold, there's McDonald's. Did anybody say that? <laughs> behold, there's the steakhouse. <laughs> we, we don't use the word behold much anymore, do we, in English? It's, but actually, like in this translation that I've showed you here in the NIV, it's the word contemplate. It's, it's, it's the idea to think about, to, to, have, to have a focus on. And I kind of love in 1 John chapter 1, John says there, when he talks about the apostles like being with Jesus, I said, John says, we saw him. Now, that word there in the Greek, we saw him, literally means we observed him. We studied him. Like, we, want, we, want, we weren't distracted. We, we zoomed in to, to look at who he is and what he was doing. And I, and I think that's a very different thing to, like, just letting it pass you by. You know, say for argument's sake, if, like, you're standing on a corner and a bus passes you by, and, and I ask you, like, you know, what did the bus look like? And you just said, oh, the, bu the bus was red. You know, you've just given me, like, a brief description of it. But if you said, oh, yeah, the bus was red, it had about 15 seats in it, the driver had a blue jacket on, it's like all of a sudden I think, oh, wow, this guy observed that bus. He didn't just see the bus passing by, he observed it. And this is what John is talking about. He's talking about being focused and zooming in on Jesus and contemplating him. And I believe that's one of the ways that we, you know, that one of the reasons for like worship and the power of worship is that in worship we focus, we focus in on Jesus and we behold the presence of God and the glory of God and we start to contemplate and think about who he is. And I actually believe, and I kind of, I don't know whether this is a prophetic word or or whether, but just something bubbling in my spirit that has been for a while, is I want you to just pause for a moment and think of the word focus. I believe that it's a word for the church at the moment, and that the Holy Spirit is bringing the church back into focus. There is too much distraction going on in this world, and God wants us to focus and bring us actually into something. So I believe that as we contemplate the glory and we focus, and when we're worshiping, we're actually present in our worship. So we're not thinking, you know, it's, I hope I don't burn the chicken. I hope I don't burn the beef. Like, you know, did I switch the cooker down? It's like, let's focus. We focus right in and we contemplate. And what Paul is saying is that when you do that, when you focus on God and you contemplate and you, and you think about him, you will start to get changed more and more into that same image. How many of us know that you kind of tend to become like the gods you worship? That's actually what it says in the Bible. You become like the gods you worship. So if you worship materialism, you'll probably feel a bit empty because you're much more than material. <laughs> but if you focus on God, who's got love and emotions and power in him, that you, you, all of a sudden, you, and you see the goodness of God, you start to contemplate on the goodness of God. All of a sudden, goodness starts to flow from you. You become like the God you worship. 
And so let's contemplate on the God, uh, on the God that we worship. And as we do that, you will become more and more transformed. Now, you might not always realize it, but I can tell you now, people will. I don't know if you like any of you been into like bodybuilding or a bit of training, and you you kind of you keep and going to the gym, and you don't see a lot of you don't see a lot of change, and it's like oh man, here we go again, and there's not much change going on. And then one day somebody says to you, oh man, you've lost some weight. It's like often they see it before you do, right? I say to Karen sometimes, oh, do you notice I've lost some weight? She says, no, I can't see it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So it only works with some people, apparently. <laughs> but people will see the glory of God on you and rising on you as you contemplate. So as we focus, as we worship, we will get changed into that same image. And I want to declare over you today and over us that we will leave this place being a glory carrier. People will actually see it on our lives. Amen. Amen. And by the way, I mean, I say that, you know, in worship, you can also, obviously, this is the sort of stuff we do in our own home as well. By ourselves, we fill our cars with worship as we're driving to, a, driving to work or dropping the kids off at school. You know, we've got worship going on. We're filling the atmosphere with worship and we're focusing on him. The second one, quickly, is this. Just simply being in his presence. Just being in his presence. Here's a really cool scripture in 1 John 3, 2. John says, dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, once again, what John is saying is that when Jesus comes back, for those of us who are in relationship with Jesus, you will be transformed in his presence. Isn't that cool? You're not going to drop dead. And you're going to be transformed. You're going to be made all of a sudden fit for his glory and fit for his presence on a whole new, on a whole new level. But this text here in many ways connects it with the last point, which is we get changed by what we see. So th that's why it's important to pray for revelation, because the more revelation that you get, the more you change. And I want to suggest that just dwelling in the presence of God will actually cause you to change. It'll cause you to do this thing about focusing and observing. Many of you have heard me saying before that one, I think one of my favorite books actually uh, out there, which is a classic, is called The Practice of the Presence of God. Uh, by, well, it's, a, it's a, basically, it's a string of letters that were written to a guy called Brother Lawrence, who was a monk in the 1700s, and people were just asking him questions, because he just seemed to have this incredible relationship with God. So people would write letters to him, so like, how, you know, how did you get to where you are now? It's actually a funny story, because Brother Lawrence, when he first signed up for the monastery, he actually put himself into the monastery as a way of punishment. Um, he, he was really hard on himself. He felt pretty condemned about his life. Um, it's quite funny when you read the book because you pick up that really he was a very clumsy type person. He used to drop this and drop that. And he was clumsy and he used to break things and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know if that's an over-exaggeration, but that's the, definitely the feel you get when you read through the book. And he put himself into the monastery basically to try and like... Um, you know, it's like penitence for his, for his failures and his mistakes. And he actually says that God disappointed him because he found that God was not like that at all. He said, the God that I discovered was full of goodness. He was full of love. He was full of mercy. And then what happened is that Brother Lawrence went through a process with what he called practicing the presence of God. And now this is what practicing the presence of God does, right? It's like this. Basically, I take a pause for, I, I pause in my day for a moment, and I contemplate on the fact that God is with me. He's right there, right by my side. In fact, I would say that as a Christian this morning, I believe Joyce Meyer is actually bang on when she says that God is closer to you than the air you breathe. He's living in you. It's just to think that God is with you. But look, look, right, this is a habit, right? This is practice. That's why it's called the practice of the presence of God. 
I pause and I contemplate that God is with me. And then what I do is I talk to him. I talk. I get it all out. Great way of counseling, I suppose, isn't it? I just, I just share with him my failures, my struggles, my hopes, my dreams. I tell him how much I love him. I wait and hear for him to tell me he loves me. And I practice it. And then Brother Lawrence says, all of a sudden you'll find yourself, you'll get distracted. Don't, don't beat yourself up over that, he says. Just bring your mind back. Just bring your mind back. And keep practicing it. And then the th the, you'll come to a point where it'll become like second nature. Where you'll just know the presence of God is with you all the time. But I just feel like, a pr like an anointing on that just as I'm saying it. And I want to encourage you to, to make it a habit, make it a practice in your life that God is with you and talk with him. And I believe that as you do that, God will bring you into something. In fact, I don't know um, what's happened in my life, I, if I could share a quick testimony. I'm not saying I lost anything, right? I've always loved God and stuff like that. I'm not saying I lost anything, but maybe I got a bit distracted. I don't know. What I can tell you is that for the last, I don't know, 18 months or something like that, I felt like God has bring me into a focus like I've never experienced before. I say this with all, all humility, right, what I'm about to say, but I thank people who have come up to me and they've said, I've seen, man, you've changed. There's something different about you. Something, something's happened to you. And I want to tell you that what it's rooted and grounded in is focus. It's focusing and pushing off the distractions. And what I've done, is, I don't know, it's like the Holy Spirit brought me into something, and I just feel like I've been talking to this invisible person. But I'm focused. And all of a sudden, I feel a manifestation of God's presence. In fact, I, I don't know if the guys can put a picture up on the screen. Or, do you guys remember like the, the, the Ready Breck, Ready Breck Man advert? You know, like that, that, that guy there, he's got like an aura around him, right? I, actually, when Tom sent me this on Friday, I said, oh man, isn't that funny? I said, typical of the presence of God. One person feels repelled from it and one person loves it. That's, that's pretty bibli ac biblically accurate, right? <laughs> but I, I, f I, don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but I feel, it's more of a feeling. I feel, like, I feel like this guy. I feel like I'm in a bubble. I feel like the presence of God is all over me. Sometimes I can't contain myself. I feel like just blowing up. Wow, what have I discovered here? And I find myself talking and I realize that this person that I'm with, this invisible person, has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions. And he's sharing them with me. Man, I tell you guys, the more we focus, the more we press in and practice the presence of God, God is going to do something amazing in our life. And we, I believe that we'll walk away feeling like this guy. And I kind of feel it myself. In fact, actually, in, even when I, became, uh, when I first became a Christian, I just like, had some experiences where I went to see a friend of mine. Um, he was still kind of doing the old stuff that we used to do years ago. And uh, I'd become a Christian. I was in Bible college. And then I used to go and visit him when I'd get home from, from college. And I'd talk to him about, about, about Jesus and stuff like that. And afterwards, after he got converted, his testimony was what he said to me. He said, I didn't really understand a lot of what you were saying. He said, but when you used to come to see me, there was something shining through your skin. Something shining through you. He said, I can't explain it. Now, I didn't know that. But apparently, I was a glory carrier. Because I'd experienced God in such a powerful way in a prison cell. And I'd spent, been spending time in Bible college. I'd become a glory carrier. And I want to encourage each and every single one of us that we can become glory carriers. It'll just start to manifest. Practice the presence of God. Focus on Him. Man, don't, like, it's a non-negotiable. Don't let anyone or anything steal it from you. Your time to focus. Zooming in. Man, sometimes I say to God, God, I know I can't catch you out. You know everything. But I try to surprise God. About 25 times a day, I may say to him, hey, I love you. I 
love you. I know you know I'm going to say it, but I love you. Do you feel that moment? Did you feel that? Did you feel those? I love you. And I don't know what it's done, but it's opening something up. It's taking me into new levels of glory. And I want to encourage you and me to do the same. Is that good? Right, just last, uh, last point, really, really quick. I felt I needed to linger on that just a moment. But the last point, and I'll just wrap this up in a couple of minutes, is simply this, putting on the new you, right? Putting on the new you. Colossians 3, verse 8 to 10 says this. Paul says this. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. In other words, it's going back to the Adam and Eve thing about being an image bearer. Paul is saying that we lost that somehow. But now you become born again and you become recreated. Put off the old self, put off the old practices and step into your new clothing. Put your new clothes on. Don't be somebody who's got rage or jealousy or envy or anger. That's not you anymore. That's what Paul is saying. It's not you anymore. That's not who you are anymore. Put them practices off. And I just want to really kind of land it on this last point. Because this is not as hard as what you might think. In Colossians chapter 3, the same chapter in verse 4, Paul says this, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now, I want to just say to you that there's, when we come to Christ, there's, a, there's actually, it's not just a changed life, but an exchanged life. Let me explain what I mean. A changed life might be, oh, thank God I've been set free from drug addiction. I've been set free from something I've changed. God has done something in my life. An exchanged life means that Christ is living through you. And I don't know if that landed then, but Christ who is your life, Paul says. So in other words, if I run out of love for someone, I say, God, I've run out of love. Will you love through me? I mean, actually, I probably shouldn't have said it like that because all of every part of it should be him flowing through us. But I'm just, I'm using that kind of contrast to make a point. That sometimes, who runs out of patience? Who runs out of love sometimes? Like, who just feels all those things where you just feel like you've come to the end of your humanity? Now, what Paul is saying is like, hey, you don't need to worry about that because there's somebody living inside you when you just simply say, and I've, I've actually done this, and it works. <laughs> I say, Jesus, I feel like I'm running out of patience. Will you demonstrate your patience through me? And I felt a change. Something's changed. Lord, I feel like I'm running out of love. Will you love this person through me? All of a sudden, something kicks in. So, I'm going to say that something kicks in. If you just ask, something kicks in. And his name is Jesus. He is your life. It's not just a changed life. It's an exchange life. Now, linking this with what Pastor Mark was talking about, the glory of God being the goodness of God. Man, this is it, right? This is it in practical terms. This is it in like on a day-to-day -day basis. Lord, I've run out of, I don't feel good right now about this towards this person. Would you be good through me? Jesus is more than happy to say, yeah, because that's what this thing is all about. This is not just you living your life now like you used to. This is me living through you. Is that awesome? Isn't that awesome this morning? I have come to an end. I could keep on preaching, but I just want to wrap it up by saying I just pray. My prayer is that what I've said this morning, or at least something of what I said this morning, will land on you, will transform you. And that we will leave this place being glory carriers. That we will focus. We won't let anything steal that away from us. We will practice the presence of God. We'll focus on Jesus. We'll observe him. We'll monitor him. We'll analyze him. We'll love him. We'll lift him up. When something tries to distract you, no way. 
In Jesus' name, I'm focused here. And we put on the new you. Put on the new you. Jesus wants to live through you. You're not on your own with this thing. And I believe that when we put these things into place, we will, and I say it, you know, affirmatively, we will experience the presence and the power and the goodness of God. And not only will we experience it, not only will we have our Eden, but God will use us to extend that Eden experience globally right across the world. Isn't that cool? Come on, let's lift him up this morning in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Yeah. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that, God, this will become a revelation for us. I pray we'll walk from this place, Lord, feeling equipped, encouraged, Father, built up, stirred up, God, and that we would just go out of this place feeling like we're glory carriers in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen.